And so we have an experience with partners called Inside the Ropes. So they'll walk behind the walker scorer on the fairway with the mm. golfers. And one of our partners had a couple of kids come in to follow the players around for Cameron Smith's group. And I basically had to introduce them to Cameron Smith on the on the tee box, which I could just see like the awe in their faces. Like, oh my God, yeah. it's Cameron Smith. And I just remember thinking to myself going, that's so cool that mm. we get to facilitate that kind of moment for someone. Yeah. I think back to myself watching footy, watching cricket as a kid, like looking up like Brett Lee, Glenn McGrath, Ricky Ponting. Imagine that. Like that's what we've done for that kid, but in golf. G'day guys, coming up on the show today is Clayton Henderson. Clayton is the commercial partnerships coordinator at Golf Australia. He's one of the great members of the sports rec community with experience at Wesley College, the NRL and Cricket Victoria. Clayton is also part of Rare Company with this being his second episode. You might have heard him in episode 183 as well, talking about his journey to finding work in the sports industry prior to his role at golf. Today, we touch on his career so far, some of the things he does day to day to be the best he can be and what the first six months looks like in a new role at Golf Australia. Let's go. I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast, the ultimate guide to make it in the sports industry. I'm Ryan Walker and joining me is the Eagle, Reuben Williams. We are two mates who met at Cricket Australia and each week we learn how people made it in sports and tease out their career decisions, their work habits, skills and everything they do that makes them great. Also, you can learn how to get in, get promoted and get thriving in the sports industry. Rubes, how are you, mate? G'day, Ryan. Doing well, thank you. Uh, I hope you're not associating Eagle with anything golf-related to me because <laughs> I'm a shocking golfer. Oh. I've never ventured anything close to an Eagle in my life. You, on the other hand, I think, <laughs> was this just a comment to try and get me to ask you, have you ever got an Eagle? Nah, 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 never. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I will say, though, <laughs> I've played one round of golf with you and I play too much and you play way too little, and you can hit the ball a lot better than I can, which is just demoralising. Maybe one in ten strikes, I It think. wouldn't surprise <laughs> me if you've probably hit an eagle before. Oh, no, um, not that I can remember. So, no, that is, you know, I, I thought eagle is necessary today. We've got a big guest, and mm. it's very golf-related. So I thought that that suits you, and, too. And a little backstory to how Clayton ended up in his second episode. Mm. So way back last year, we were interviewing uh, another great sports grad member, Nathan Peroni, who just got his brand new job at Western United Football Club as a commercial partnerships coordinator. Yep. And when he arrived in the studio, he said to us, oh, I've just finished having coffee with, uh, with Clayton Henderson. And we're like, oh, what, what are we doing there? He goes, oh, well, Clayton's, you know, back from the UK. He's looking for a job. And so he just wanted to catch up and and get some advice mm. and that's when it gave when nathan gave us the idea to get clayton in the studio yeah to give him some advice on air yeah and now he's gone on to get a job so we thought we'd get him back in here to chat again to hear about it so um well done to clayton for reaching out to nathan to have that conversation then well done to nathan for letting <laughs> us know because that first episode may never have happened had those circumstances never eventuated so no absolutely funny how things work out i love that we had to get him back in we had to get him back in. There's, there's lots happening in his world, so uh, we're super excited for this. So let's get cracking. Guys, follow us on LinkedIn, and if you want to connect with us and hundreds of others working in sport, become a member of the Sports Grade community. Rubes, what is happening in our community at the moment? Oh, heaps, Ryan, heaps. A uh, couple of shout-outs to begin with, uh, some wins in the community. Uh, firstly, to Clayton who's just got a 12-month extension at Golf Australia, mm. which we're going to hear all about in just a moment. Um, also one of the great lifetime members of, of Sports Grade. We no yeah. longer offer lifetime memberships, but uh, when that was yeah. available, he jumped on that. So well done to him. Um, and the other one I want to call out is Devin Ediwira, who's just got a new job as a com customer experience supervisor in digital marketing at Latrobe Sport. He's another one who has been on the hunt for a while and now landed in a space he's really happy with. So... Well done to you, Devin. 
Uh, the job board's popping off. There's some great roles up there at the moment. Amma Sports have got a really good one um, where you'll be working with the Wilson Customer Service. So they look after the license for, for Wilson in Australia. The Queensland Rugby League have got a partnerships coordinator role open at the moment, mm. which would just be unreal. Up the Dolphins, I'm not sure if you saw them get their first win, <laughs> yeah. but um, all aboard. Uh, Cricket New South Wales, we've got a fantastic one. Cricket Program Coordinator, North Melbourne Football Club as well. If you're into AFL, marketing executive is up there. So plenty of hot jobs on the sports grad job yep. board. Uh, and then inside the community, we've got a whole host of events coming up where you can meet a few of our podcast guests, chat about specific topics related to their area or chat about some other areas related to job hunting. So last week we chatted commercial partnerships with Jordan Ionuzzi from the New York Red Bulls of all places. This week we're chatting LinkedIn content and profile. So if, you, if your profile's not up to scratch or if you feel like you could be doing more on there, get yeah. along to that. Then we're going to get Clayton in for a chat as well after that. We've also got an AFL player agent coming in if you want to meet an agent and hear what it's like uh, to work in that space, as well as an organisational psychologist in Simon Osborne who's going to be talking about confidence and imposter syndrome to mm. help with some of those issues too. So, Jeez. It's a big lineup. <laughs> it's a How's big the calendar? It's really filled out the over the next month or so. packed, yeah. absolutely packed. But, um, you know, if you're like me and you can't remember everything, you just want it in a nice little place, then you're going to love the Sports Grad newsletter. Uh, there's a link in our show notes and on our website where you can sign up to that. And every Friday, we'll send you an email with all the latest job opportunities, all the events, all the latest podcast content resources, a lot. So if you want everything in one nice, tidy place to keep you up to date with what's going on in the industry, subscribe to the newsletter. Amazing. Well, there's so much happening. Get involved. But uh, for the time being, grab a pen, enjoy this chat with Clayton Henderson. Before we jump into the episode, we've got a quick message from our good friends at Deakin University. Deakin has been a huge supporter of sports grad since day one. If you're currently studying or you've just finished studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a huge leg up over other potential candidates applying for that same role. So if you want to pump up your resume and get specialized knowledge in sports behavior, law, marketing, ethics, finance, governance, and strategy, take a look at Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management is not one of, but the best one in Australia, ranked at number one. So add a postgrad to your resume, and that's our tip for the episode. Clayton, welcome back to the Sports Grad Podcast, mate. Thanks for having me, boys. Good to be back. Clayton, we've only ever had, I think, three or four people return to the podcast. You are now on that list. Uh, tell us what you've been doing for the last six months because there's a very good reason why you've got we've got you back in here. Um, so I've been at Golf Australia for probably the last four months. Um, before that was at Cricket Victoria, but I um, was able to find a, a job in commercial partnerships thanks to yourself, Rubes. Um, so it's, it's been a really good time over the last probably three months with the Australian Open and the Vic Open going on. Um, but it's been a very exciting time in the event space for golf. Well, we're very happy for you. We're very happy to see where, where you've landed because uh, I think it was May 2022, we had you in this room uh, chatting all things careers, where you wanted to end up, had a look at your resume, had a look at your cover letter. And uh, to see it work out for you is, is fantastic. Was there anything specifically that you remember from that first chat that we had that stuck with you through the process of getting these jobs? Uh, I think it was a combination of what you yourself spoke about and what Nathan spoke about when I caught up with him. Um, but I think it was just being a bit more, I suppose, vigorous in your application process and just continuing to apply. I think at that point when I was looking for something, I was trying to find something that was perfect for me rather than just trying to find something at all. Mm. Um, but I also was probably a bit pent up on trying to find something full time when I could have probably been maybe finding something that was casual but was a bit more aligned to what I wanted to do. Um, but I think what stood out to me was just continuing to apply, even if it wasn't maybe where you wanted to end up. Mm. It's, a, it's a good starting base and ended up pretty well with, with that advice that you gave me. Amazing. Nice, oh, mate. And uh, how did it feel when you got that phone call from Golf Australia to say Clayton would love to give you the job? It was pretty odd because it was a pretty quick process. Um, so obviously you got in touch with um, with me about the opportunity because my manager now, Sammy, um, at, at Golf was looking for a partnership coordinator and you, you got in touch and 
I think it was maybe a week, a week, maybe even six days later, I was just offered the role and it was pretty quick. It's not your, your standard um, orthodox uh, application <laughs> process. I think I caught up with her for, for a chat and then that was, that was it. On the Friday afternoon, I got the call and it was like, what the hell? How's that happened? <laughs> it didn't really seem like it was real. And uh, you, right. since then, you've gone through the first four or five months. You've now been offered an extension. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so 12 months extension. Um, so Sammy's going on maternity leave uh, at the beginning of April, I believe, um, which has sort of worked in my favour, considering that um, a partnership manager is coming in on her mat leave. Um, so over the last probably year and a half, Sammy's been doing the work of two people. Um, so having me on board before Beck, who's her replacement, comes in, it allows me to take on a bit more responsibility in my role and allows her to come into Sammy's cover with not as much as what Sammy was doing because, to be honest, she was mm. doing a lot of work and it would be very difficult for a mat leave cover to come in and, and learn all that so quickly. So that's worked in my favour because it's allowed them to justify having me for another 12 months in a full-time capacity and I think um, everyone's a winner. Yeah. Did you um, – because obviously we've got coffees in hand today and that was because you've you've bought them in for us. I was just wondering, do you buy the coffees around Golf Australia as well? Is that how you've sort of nailed this 12-month contract on forward? It's all about the coffees, mate. It's all about the coffees. If you buy the coffees, you know, the world's your oyster, mate, really. <laughs> nice, mate. Good. Gives you good access to some important people, surely. It does. It does. <laughs> um, well, that's phenomenal, mate. Um, and it's cool hearing how quickly things have happened for you. But was there ever a point where you thought, I'm never going to get – where I want to go? Not necessarily, because at that point when um, I was given the offer with, with golf, I was still halfway through the contract at Cricket Vic. Um, so that would have only finished end of January. So there still would have been time to look for other opportunities when that finished. Um, but I'd, I'd spoken with you guys a couple of times about how I wanted to work in partnerships eventually, um, but it wasn't something that after this, it's, it's got to be partnerships. It's got to be, I think. I took that advice from our initial chat saying, you know, just look for something that's somewhat relevant. You don't need to be in what you're looking for because you can sort of get caught up and get stuck in a spiral mm. trying to find that one role. Um, but I was just lucky that it ended up being that way. So, Brilliant, mate. Well, we're stoked for you. It's great news. When we saw that come through the other day, we were uh, cheering. It's uh, super exciting. So, um, mate, new segment this year. I'm sure you would have heard, given you're an, an avid listener of the podcast. It's called Quick Fire Questions. So, we're going to fire some at you up, going to get some quick responses from you and uh, allow the listeners at home to learn a little bit more about you, which is what this is all about. So I'll start and uh, we'll kick it off. Uh, first one, what's your first ever job? First ever job was in a bottle shop. So straight out of year 12 into a bottle shop, um, right next to a train station as well. So plenty of characters <laughs> dealing with straight out of school. So you learn a lot. You learn yeah. a lot. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, and what did you study at university? I uh, did a Bachelor of Business at La Trobe and just did a minor of study in, in sport management. Favourite sporting moment? Richmond winning the flag in 2017. <laughs> uh, and favourite question you like to ask or like to be asked? How many tennis balls do they use at the Australian Open? <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice problem-solving one. <laughs> that is a good one. Um, what's one book or podcast you'd recommend for people that's helped you at work? Uh, there's a book that I'm reading at the moment. Um, it's called Persuasion, The Psychology of Persuasion, I think it's called. Um, nice. I've only a dozen pages in at the moment, and it's really good. Really good. By uh, Dr. Robert Caldini. Yes, that's yep. the one. It's a good one. Uh, are you associated with any grassroots sporting clubs? Yeah, so I play at uh, the Ringwood Career Club, but I'm also the um, fast bowling coach for the girls' program there as well. Brilliant, big tall fella. Can bowl. I don't bowl quick. I just tell them how to bowl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and lastly, if you had 30 minutes to pick anyone's brain, who would it be? See, I'm still stumped on that one. Genuinely. I don't know. There's too many people. I genuinely could give you an answer. Would there be like a specific sphere or space that they would operate in? Well, there are just so many people. Like if it was a sport-related person, like an athlete, someone related to my career, it's just too difficult to pick. I genuinely, I'm too indecisive as it is. <laughs> probably <laughs> someone from the 2017 flag, maybe. Yeah, probably Koch. Dusty. Nah, not Dusty. <laughs> I think Koch would give me a bit more. He probably wouldn't give you a lot either. No. Mate. No, I'll go with Koch. Yeah, Koch. <laughs> Brilliant. Very good. 
Well, nicely handled. Well, um, uh, you mentioned a couple of different things that you've done along the journey, but let, let's let's go right back, and um, we'd love to hear step by step the uh, the series of experiences that you've been through to to get to this job. So, walk us through it. Where where did it begin for you? Uh, so, it probably began in my last year of uni in twenty twenty one. At that point, I think oh, it was maybe what the third or fourth week of the first semester. And I was sort of thinking about what was going to happen post uni, um, decided to download LinkedIn and then just started blind connecting with people, which is how we ended up getting connected, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, I just thought, oh, yeah, I'll just get a couple of connections, see what happens, see what all the fuss is about. Um, and then throughout the year, I ended up um, getting an internship with the NRL um, and that was based off connection with LinkedIn. So someone who I um, used to be coached by in cricket, Scotty McNaughton, um, I got in touch with him on LinkedIn because I saw he was working at the NRL. A mate of mine um, from high school had done an internship with him through his sport management course. So I just reached out and said, look, we're looking to do some unpaid work. It's not a part of my uni course or anything. Got me on board, um, was there for probably four or five months, just online during during 2021. Um, and then finished uni, um, geez, I'm trying to think because I had a million jobs at that point. <laughs> I was... I was doing the venue manager stuff for Wesley College um, in the cricket, so I was doing all their training sessions for cricket, uh, a bit of team manager stuff as well. Um, at that time, I was also in community cricket development with Cricket Vic, so doing school clinics casually. I was doing a little bit for Melbourne Stars, a bit of fan engagement. I only did that for a couple of months. Um, I think I had the NRL still going on at that time as well, so I had heaps of stuff going on, um, and I get lost in it all when I try to relive what had happened. Um and then that brings us to 2022, which was over in England for a bit, playing some cricket uh, after a bit of a hiatus away from everything. And then to our chat last year, um, which then landed me at Cricket Vic in my first full-time role and then golf. Lovely, mate. Uh, and what, what's the first six months looked like at, at golf? Um, you know, what have you been working on? What are some of those key things you've been hitting? So essentially the role was only going to be until mid-March, so around now. Um, so it was only for assistance with the Australian Open and the Vic Open, so assisting Sammy and her account management of all of our corporate partners um, because the Australian Open was the first time we've had it in Victoria in I think like 13 or 14 years or something like that. Um, so there was a lot to be done and I think I was only at golf for two and a half weeks before the Australian Open started, so it was pretty hectic mm. um, trying to learn all the partners that we have, all of the... Um, experiences that the partners are entitled to and all of their VIP stuff. Um, so it was pretty sink or swim there for about a month. It was pretty hectic. Yeah. Um, I still sort of think how I got through it is amazing. Um, so that was pretty good learning about the different levels of partners that we've got at golf and then also with the Vic Open uh, we've just had at the start of February. Um, so the entire time it's just been prepping for Oz Open. It was post-event reporting for Oz Open and then it was the lead up to Vic Open and now it's the post-event reporting for Vic Open and then what happens in the extension, we'll, we'll wait and see. And, and during that time, have there been any early career highlights, any moments where you're like, oh my gosh, this is this is cool? I think just being at the Oz Open was pretty cool. I've never been to a golf event before because I'm not a massive golfer, I'm a pretty casual golfer. I'm probably a driving range golfer if I ever was one. <laughs> um, but just being at the Oz Open, we had 50,000 people through over the weekend, walks being one of them. Yeah. Um, it was just really cool to be there on the final day at the 18th green and just to see the atmosphere around golf was something that I'd not seen before. And also to have men's, women's and all abilities playing in the same tournament at once, that was really cool. Like That was like at the world first, we're the first ones to do that. So to be a part of that was really cool as well. Nice. Yeah, I must say, going to that event, it, it's a different event, don't you think? You know, you would have been to plenty of AFL, you would have been plenty of cricket, you would have been in the Australian Open. Saying that golf was a little bit different, like it was everyone appreciated the, like almost appreciated the course. Like, you know, it's a weird sport. Everyone loves the architecture of the course. It's like, <laughs> gee, the grass is looking good. Like no one comments on that stuff in the AFL mm. or the cricket. Like I feel like the people who are there are all just diehards. You, know, you see that during the Pro-Am before the tournament and then the yeah. Am-Am afterwards. You see the blokes hitting around on the uh, tournament tees with the signage yeah. and they think, oh, how good's this? Yeah. And you would too, except I'd be 
hitting my ball into the car park, whereas they're dialing it in on the green. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Like, I mean, like for us, like imagine if you could go out and face a couple of balls on the pitch in the middle of the MCG. I oh. presume this is a, a like-for-like situation for these golf diehards, except, you know, th- those courses are open every week if you want to go want to go and play on them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even when the bump out's happening, the finish of the event week, there are club members just going for their regular and they've still yeah. got course signage up, so it's really cool. Yeah. And also, like, the the access to the athletes in golf, I reckon, is a little bit different to mm. what you see in the AFL, say. Like, we could go and watch Cam Smith putt on the main putting grade in front of everybody. And if you're standing close enough, he's probably a couple of metres away from you. Mm. It's like you don't really get that anywhere. That was you know? probably one of the things as well, like, Two and a half weeks, three weeks into the job, and I'm just meeting Cam Smith on the tee box. It's like so I don't even think yeah. about that as like one of the highlights because it's just like so casual. Yeah. I didn't even think about it, but now when I'm sort of thinking about it, yeah, I just yeah went up to Cam Smith. Hey, man, it, it's I reckon in in a couple of years' time you'll look back at that and you'll be like, you know, that that actually is a massive highlight. Like I, I feel like, and you know, we've done this. Whereas like you're on the ground at the MCG on Boxing Day, and at the time you're probably not thinking about that as like, this is the best thing I've ever done at work. Mm. But now that when I look back, I'm like, geez, you like, should appreciate that more and should, you know, think about that as like a career highlight because it really is. Mm. So yeah. like you might not sink in yet, but it will. I think because I was working at the time that it happened, I sort of, yeah, I didn't really yeah. give it a once over. But the kids, so we have an experience with partners called Inside the Ropes. So they'll walk behind the walker scorer on the fairway with the mm. golfers. Um, and one of our partners had a couple of kids come in to follow the players around for Cameron Smith's group. Um, and I basically had to introduce them to Cameron Smith on the on the tee box, which I could just see like the awe in their faces, like, oh, my God, yeah. it's Cameron Smith. And I just remember thinking to myself going, that's so cool that mm. we get to facilitate that kind of moment for someone. Yeah. I think back to myself watching footy, watching cricket as a kid, like looking up like Brett Lee, Glenn McGrath, Ricky Ponting. Imagine that. Like that's what we've done for that kid but in golf. And that's probably why I don't yeah. really think about it that much because I was working. But for that moment for that kid, it's super yeah. special. And you probably think as well like someone should be doing this for me because I'm a fan. Like, I remember doing a similar thing in the rooms of the Adelaide Test one day. I'm, like, leading a group from Qantas through there. I'm like, I've got no right to be doing this. <laughs> like, I'm a fan like you. <laughs> what am I doing in here? Like, crazy. Even at the gala event that we had for the Oz Open where me and Sammy were sat at the table doing, like, the entry list and, like, all the golfers are coming through, like Adam Scott, Cameron Smith. Yeah. It's like, I shouldn't be the one taking these guys' names. Like, this is so no. – I, sh- I can't be this close. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's incredible. And golf is like a sneaky superstar sport. Like these guys are making multi, multi millions. I feel like sometimes people in Australia forget that there are these sports that are huge on the world stage that just overshadow the local sports like AFL, NRL, even cricket to an extent, Mm. all great, but no one's making 10 million bucks a year playing any of those sports. No. Whereas you look at golf and you've got – what Camp Smith doing, just doing hundreds of millions in a year with Liv. Mm. Um, people forget, I guess, I guess the, the magnitude of, of some of these guys. Yeah, and if they're winning their tournaments as well, like they are making so much money. But it also it helps when you've got tournaments all around the world as well. There are opportunities, but you've got to be the best because if you're not winning, you're not getting paid. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, awesome. So, uh, Clayton, prior to joining golf, you were working at Cricket Victoria selling memberships on behalf of the Melbourne Stars. Um, and I remember chatting to you prior to this, um, and it kind of felt like you were, would you say you were at a bit of a, a crossroads at this point in time? And um, when that job came up at golf, how did you decide what to do next? Because I know it, it didn't quite have all the requirements that you were looking for. How did you um, feel at the time and how did you kind of make that decision? Um, so you sort of get to a point, so we're selling memberships to the Stars and the Renegades. Um, you sort of get to a point when you're calling up people, asking them to renew in August and September, and they don't want to know you because the footy's on. Gets to a point where you pick up the phone, you put it down, it's like, that's really starting to get stale. Like That's that's really hurting. Um, but it was really good. We had a lot of great people at Cricket Vic that I was working with that made it a really, um, really good place to work, and they kept you motivated and kept you going, kept you picking up the phone. Um, but, yeah, it definitely got to a point where, 
you had done all you were going to do in that role and it was just going to be a repeat of that process. Um, and I remember we had a chat um, when we went to the – we came here and then went out um, to – what was it that we had? Like a little function or something that we – and we were chatting about oh, what yeah. I wanted to do. Um, and we had that conversation about, oh, you know, I'd love to move into partnerships and then a couple of weeks later that – opportunity came up it was just funny that we were speaking about it um but I still sort of felt a little bit odd about leaving the role at, at Cricket Vic because I was only halfway through a contract but I also didn't know how well I'd do in the process with golf I didn't think that it was as almost guaranteed as what it was um so I thought if I apply not only apply if I, if I chat about it with them and see where they're sitting with it if it doesn't turn out the way I want it to and I don't get the job how does that look at Cricket Vic when I'm only halfway through mm. halfway through a, a, a contract? You know, they won't want to extend someone that's, you know, trying to get out. Not that I was trying to get out. That opportunity just came up and it was too good to refuse. The opportunity to work in partnerships um, was you know, too too good to turn down. Mm. What, what about the uh, the time period attached to what was on offer at golf versus at Cricket Vic? How did that play in your mind? So it was uh, another month and a half. So cricket was going to finish end of Jan and then golf was going to finish mid-March. So it didn't really play that much in my mind. I think it was more so the experience of being in a partnerships role. Mm. First year out of uni was just too much to turn down. Like that was mm. it. That mm. was the only pro I needed in that job that made me go, yep. Yeah. There yeah. are a lot of cons that came with it, you know, not wanting to leave halfway through, what if I don't get it? being in, in partnerships at an early stage was just too good to pass up. Yeah. What would you say, I think, because that problem comes up a little bit, doesn't it? Mm. You know, someone sees a role that is six months long and they're like, oh, what do I do after six months, right? It can play in your mind or, you know, should I go for something else that's longer? So how, how did you come up with that? I know, I know you just mentioned there, like, that all you needed was that. But for those out there that are probably pondering that, same question, like, do I go for something for six months or not? What would you kind of say? Like, how, how do you get to that decision to say, yeah, I'm going to do it? I suppose for me it was a bit easier because I had been approached to, to have a chat about this role. I didn't go out and apply for it myself. Mm. So that made it a lot different. Yeah. Um, I think when people are in jobs and they look outward to another opportunity, it can be quite difficult to make that first jump because you don't want to just start applying while you're in the middle of a job, particularly a contract role. Um, so it made it really easy for me having that um, opportunity being given to me. Um, but I think just having conversations doesn't hurt. I remember chatting with with you guys on the phone about it. I was chatting with Nathan and Brandt about it as well, just because they're in partnerships as well. Um, but just to get some perspective on different approaches, Nathan mm -hmm. had been in a similar role, uh, sorry, a similar situation, so had Brandt. Um, but it, it just came down to having chats. So I spoke with Sammy about the role. I was really clear about my situation that I was halfway through a contract and she was able to accommodate for that. Um, and then when I spoke to my manager at Cricket Vic, she was the same. She was really supportive. She said, the opportunity's too good. Um, luckily at the time they were looking for an extra membership person to come on, so it made the transition yeah. a bit easier. So I, I was pretty lucky in the whole process. Um, but I was just lucky that I was communicating clearly with everyone. Um, that's probably the first thing. If you're really open and honest, I think things will go your way more often than not. Mm. Yeah, I, I do recall you actually saying that to me because you're like, what do I do in this predicament? Like, I don't want to upset anybody, but I also want to follow my dreams as well. I want to reach the goals that I've got for myself. Um, um, but I think um, I know from my, from my experience as well, it, it's funny how those short-term contract jobs often lead to longer jobs too. Uh, like when I first joined Cricket Australia, it was a six-month contract. And I remember at the time thinking, well, this is great. I'll just do this for six months and then I'm going to go travelling. Like I didn't think there was any possibility yeah. <laughs> of it ever being extended. And at the time I was kind of not really looking for a full-time job because I just wanted to get a bit of money before going travelling. And the fact that something came up in my dream um, mm. organisation was just like, how, how good is this? Um and then what was even better was I got to do the trip and then came back and they said, oh, Ruben, you, your role hasn't been filled yet, so you can have it back if you want. Um, so I think it, I think it's really good to see like examples like that and like yours for other people out there who might look at short-term gigs and think, well, I, I need some long-term security. Sometimes it's worth taking a punt on that because the longer-term security can come 
can come next. Um, Amrit Pal Singh from our community is another great example. I think he started on a three-month contract at Athletics Australia. Next contract, he was on a mm. six-month contract. Then he got pushed at 12. Then he got made permanent full-time, and now he's a manager. And, like, imagine if he said, no, I can't do three months. I can need something more permanent. Yeah. You know, yeah, the entire career would be different. Yeah, and I think those seasonal roles – where it's really difficult, like that membership role at Cricket Vic was purely seasonal. It wasn't going to be extended beyond the six months. Um, but again, you never know. They might find something for you in a different team, in a different branch, uh, different branch of business. But I think if you're in a role like the one I was in with golf, where it's not seasonal, it's for a purpose. You're coming in to serve a purpose rather than serving for a season. You've got that opportunity where if you do a really mm. good job, they're going to find something for you because yeah. they're going to go, we don't want to lose good people. Um, but, yeah, with with roles that are seasonal, membership roles like that, it can be difficult to find an extension. So if your contract work is is for a purpose and not for a season, then I think, you know, if you're doing a good enough job, you'll probably find out you'll be you'll be extended. Yeah. you got to back yourself as well. Mm. Back yourself to make the impression. Like similar to what you just said there. If you're good, you'll, you'll stick around. Mm. Um, were there some moments when you thought, I know I've made the right decision here? Like you you thought, yep, I've done real well. I think when I got it, I thought I'd made yeah. the right decision. Yeah. Particularly when my manager at Cricket Vic, Laura, she sat me down and said, this is too good to pass up. That was our initial chat after she knew that the opportunity was there. I thought she was going to be like, mm, we, we really need you to stay until we bring this new person on, whatever. But she was the complete opposite. She was championing for me to try and succeed and do what I wanted to do. At that point, when we'd had that chat, I knew I've made the right call because the people who would, would want me to stay are telling me to, to go and chase. So like, yeah. that was the moment for me. And just some extra bit of insight, and it's all right if you can't go too deep into it, but could Cricket Vic have told you no, like you need to stay? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Because it's always a tough one, right, when you – like. You know, sometimes you might be locked into like a nut, no, you got to do this for six months, but you can't really leave and go somewhere else. But it doesn't sound like that was the case. Like you, it was just a six month role and, you know, you can do what you will with that. Yeah. So they were in the process of getting an extra membership person on. Mm. Um, so initially it was just going to be myself and Matt, who was um, the consumer ops coordinator, who were going to do the bulk of the membership stuff. Yeah. Um, and then when Laura came in as the manager, she wanted to get an extra person. And I think, again, I was just lucky that at the time they were getting someone in was the crossover where I was leaving. So they were never left without someone yeah. doing that job. Had they had they not been looking for someone to fill that position, it might have been a very different story. Yeah. Timing's everything. Mm. I think um, another perspective on that, I think, uh, is uh, like no, no one can force you to do a job. No. Like if you want to leave, you can absolutely leave. Yeah. But I feel like some jobs are very um, – there's a you know a deeper purpose around some of them or like or a greater intention for why you have to be there for a certain period of time and so they, I guess the what really holds you in is like the expectation that you'll do this for a certain period of time rather mm. than you know yeah. any sort of legal contract <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think like what is probably putting the most pressure on those situations is like you know, what, what's the other person going to think what's the person who's who hired me going to think when I say halfway through it that I'm that, yeah. I'm, that I'm leaving. Yep. Like if you take it to the extreme, like imagine, I know, the, the Carlton Football Club appointing a new head coach for, for for two seasons and halfway through the first season the coach turns around and says, actually, this this isn't for me. Yep. It's like, well, why did you apply? Like yeah. why why did you join them? Like we need someone to do this to take it seriously. Yeah. So I think it's often just that expectation of the people who've hired you that binds people in. Totally. Yeah, I think if we weren't looking for that other membership person to come in, I probably have applied with golf, probably wouldn't have pursued with golf. Um, had there not been someone as my replacement, it just would have been a massive stitch up to Cricket Vic. It would have just left them, you know, high and mm. dry, which is what I, I didn't want to do at all. So, again, it was just super lucky that the timing of everything worked. Like, it was literally the most lucky, ridiculous process yeah. that ended up working. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let, let's go back a, a few months before you joined Cricket Vic because that's when re things really start to pick up for you. 
Um, back to, you know, when you say you're, you're fresh off the plane from England, you're starting to get grounded in Melbourne again, trying to find your feet. Um, give us an insight into like the, the mind of a, of a job hunter because it can be tough putting yourself out there, getting knocked back, not really sure what direction to take. Um, w- was that s- career stress a real thing for you? And, and what does it feel like being a job hunter, you know, in 2022? Yeah, it was pretty difficult at the beginning because having finished uni a few months before, it's sort of, okay, well, I'm not looking for a part-time job here. I'm looking for a full-time job to kickstart my career. So that was really difficult. Um, it probably took, well, I got back, start of June, didn't start at Cricket Vic until August. So it was a couple of months there where I was sort of pretty lost. I mm. had that chat with Nathan originally, which then ended up having that coaching session with you, Rubes. Um, so... I suppose I was pretty lucky in, in that regard that I had the resources to assist. Um, but it can be difficult, but you've just, I think, got to continue applying. You've got to continue updating your resume, your cover letter, and trying to sell yourself the best you can. It's not a plug, but, you know, the, the sports grad resources are there for a reason. You know, you, you, they're there for a reason. They're not just there to tick boxes. They will help you in that process, which was what I did. I went to those resources and tried to, tried to help myself as much as I could and just tried to apply in bulk and it ended up working. Was, was there any particular barrier in your mind that you needed to overcome or any external barrier? Did people just kept saying no or? I don't think so. I, I think there was a lack of experience there that I had or a lack of professional experience. A lot of my experience, like I said, was with Wesley, which was like a coaching role, um, fan engagement with the stars which was like a month two months you know it's not in a professional sense it was doing activations um the nrl internship was probably the only professional experience that i'd had it was more spreadsheeting that sort of thing Mm. a bit of administration um but probably the lack of experience at that point in time was the main barrier for me because you can only sell yourself to an extent without any backing and evidence to, to back that up in an interview when you get asked questions you need to back up a claim with experience. And if you don't have it, it's a difficult task. Mm. I remember in our previous chat that we had here, you you were looking some of those smaller experiences to fill that gap because it sounds like you were looking for something that was like in an office. I need to say I can go to an office and be in a professional setting before I am almost feel worthy to apply for that next level job up. Um, so it sounds like that that feeling of, not being 100% perfect kind of stood in the way of you taking the next step. Yeah, I think trying to differentiate whether I should try and get a couple of casual roles that will maybe fill a few gaps in my experience to then go, let's apply at a full-time role. I've got the, the backing in, in my experience, let's do it. Or do I just go for a full-time role straight out? Um, and that was a balancing act because it was difficult because it was a time of two months where finished uni, unemployed, how do I go about it? You know, I want to do this as quick as possible. I don't want to be sitting around doing nothing. Um, so trying to figure out, do I just go for a casual role where I might be able to fill a few gaps or do I just go hammer and tong and try and get that that full-time role and it ended up being the latter, mm. which was the preference. Mm. I think it was um, Sean Anderson at our February 2023 Melbourne meetup who said, if you're going for a job and you meet 100% of the requirements, then you're probably not going to enjoy it because you're not going to grow and be stretched mm. in it. You almost want to target jobs that you're 70, 70%, 60% qualified for because now there's room to grow and stretch yeah. and be challenged and that's the part that you'll actually enjoy most. So yeah. it can be a bit of a, a blessing in disguise not being fully qualified for the opportunities in front of you. Yeah, so that's a really good call. I was going to say as well, like it probably shows how crucial the, the Cricket Vic experience was, right, because it was your... I guess like that first taste of a, an office environment and actually going to work and being in a professional setting like day in, day out. So now you, you're better off for that. Yeah, and I think having that sales experience and having that account management experience is super crucial because there mm. would be parts of uh, not a, a coordinator role but in a manager role for partnerships. You know, there's that business development side of things where that sales comes into it um, and to have some account management experience as well is, is perfect. So I think, yeah, if I didn't have that cricket pick experience, mm. again, it would be a difficult sell to try and get into that partnership space. Yeah. Um, let's talk about golf. Uh, I love golf, <laughs> as you know. 
Um, but keen to hear about the the culture of Golf Australia. What's it like day to day? Um, you know, how many people are working there? What, what's it like at HQ? Because we went in there a few months ago and we thought this is absolutely outstanding. It was actually before I became addicted to golf. But I'm keen to hear what it's like in the inside. It's an outstanding facility. I think it's only a year old. Yeah. Um, maybe a touch more, but it's it's a really great space. Um, when I first started, I was expecting the employees to be a little bit older as the general population <laughs> of golf is, you know, a, a bit older. But there's a lot of younger people there that I sort of wasn't expecting particularly in the, the marketing space and the event space. Uh, it's quite a young pool of, of employees. Um, but in those events, so the Australian Open and the Vic Open, um, it, it was really good to work with all the different teams um, in the lead up because in commercial space, you're touching base with marketing, with events, with government relations, finance, whatever. So you meet everyone. Mm. And having those touch points allows you to build rapport with people and then that culture grows because everyone knows everyone. Um, and even though the office is quite large on two sides, you've got the PGA and GA trying to, to form together and you've got two sides of the office where it was originally GA and PGA where they're now coming together. There's, there's always a lot of people in the office when people aren't working from home. Um, but it's just a great, great place to be. I found really quickly that it was going to be an enjoyable place to work, particularly in our commercial team at the moment. It's, what, six of us. It was originally when I started three of us. So it's it's been really, really good to get to know the other branches of the business too. Tell us a bit more about the facility. What what sort of things have you got access to? Because I know there's a particular putting green that we love <laughs> venturing down to. The Himalayas you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we've got the high performance stuff downstairs, which is fantastic. Obviously, the driving range, they all have ball traces on the driving range. And then the Himalayas, as you say, are a pretty pretty crazy putty green uh, facility where it's quite literally the biggest mountains of green ever. <laughs> and we've actually got um, up in the office, there's a hole in one sheet for any of the staff that can get a hole in one on, on those holes. But uh, we're spoiled for, for the facilities that we do have. Is it true you do meetings out there? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't yet, but <laughs> there are always people grabbing putters from the bag at the door and, and heading downstairs, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, I always think about it like you'd be doing partner whips from the, the putting green, I'm sure. It's a good way to attract business, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Come for a hit. 100%. Um, tell us about um, some of your ways of working. So what in the your first kind of four or five months in the job, what, what's one work habit that you've tried to implement to help you do your job effectively? So I get to the office pretty early when I'm in. Um, I'll usually get in just before 7.30 and try and smash out about an hour and a half of stuff before people come in Um, because the desks that you're in are in a really close proximity. So there's always, you know, people chatting about things and and going over to other teams and, you know, they're obviously working with um, other teams on stuff and there's always chit-chat going around. So if I can get a lot of really quality stuff done in the morning, that's what I'll aim to do, particularly if I'm really busy. Um... But I, yeah, I like being early. I'm never late to things. I'm never on time, always early. So it's always been a life habit for me. Um, but, yeah, if I can get in there early and smash some stuff out, I'm going to have a productive day. I was definitely not like that in my first six <laughs> months. <laughs> 7.30, I think I didn't wake up until about 8.30 and then would roll into to Jollymont. 7.30, that, that is early. The traffic's oh. also better at that time of the morning too, yeah. so that's a bit of an incentive yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's a shocker getting down to Sandringham. Yeah, mm. yeah you get got a bit of a drive. That, that's even more impressive because you're coming out from the, what, the east, far mm. east. Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't know you were such an early riser. That's very impressive. It, it hurts. It's, it's not an easy <laughs> thing to do, but yeah, you get into the rhythm. I thought you were going to say, I get in early at 7.30, have a hit downstairs and then get up to the office after. <laughs> that's what I would. That's what I should start doing that. But yeah. I thought I'd get any work done to telling everyone how well I hit them, even though I didn't hit them well at all. Yeah. No, that's good. 7.30, I, I reckon I'm not sure I would have got into the office in the sevens mm. at any point. It does make a difference though, like having a period of just undistracted work that you can just focus mm. and get some stuff done because – you know, when people start coming in, you know, you never know who wants to have a chat. That can derail you, whatever. They all, everyone means well, but it can just make it difficult sometimes to get the thing you need to do done. And I think even though you're sluggish in the morning, you're probably going to be the most effective with your work in the morning because you haven't done anything, you haven't expended any of your energy. Mm. So even though the eyes are a bit draggy, you probably, you know, your brain capacity is probably at its best at that point. Were you doing that at Cricket Victoria as well or is this just 
since you joined Golf Australia? No, just since Golf Australia, because with cricket, you were getting membership calls from nine o'clock, so there was no reason to be there any earlier. Yeah. Nice. I was going to say, you must really want that extension. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it helps when you can start before nine o'clock anyway. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, mate, all right, finally. Uh, gee, we got to the end pretty quickly. It seems like it's just fine. But um, if you go back 16 months to when you, when you finish uni, what's one thing you would do differently um, if you wanted to achieve your, your goal quicker? Um, for me, probably finding some more experience during university. Um, I think the first three years for me, I was just working my casual retail job in the bottle shop, no dramas, get through, yeah. and then end of uni, find a job. But that's obviously not the way it works. You know, I found that out pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, jumping on LinkedIn, networking with people in an area that I'm interested in earlier, but then also finding something in, in an experience, in an internship or something, again, in an, in an area of interest um, would just be massive for, for when you do finish and you're trying to find something. Because um, like we said, that experience that I was probably lacking you know, I had three and a half, four years at uni to probably do something about that, but that wasn't my understanding of how uni worked back then. I didn't really have any idea of how uni was going to work. It was just turn up to your classes, do your tests, do your exam, sweet, get a piece of paper at the end of it. <laughs> but that's just not not how it works. You know, you can use university so much more effectively um, outside of outside of class. Brilliant, mate. Well, it's been unreal having you on. Um, before we go, quickly, Rubes episodes relating to commercial partnerships any others for people to listen to well firstly if if anyone wants to hear from clayton at the start of his journey when we chatted uh probably nine months ago in may 2022 uh, that was episode 183 and you can hear some of the different job hunting techniques that we discussed career direction uh issues all those different things so if you want to hear where Clayton was way back then. That's episode 183. If you want to hear another two-part journey, listen to Nathan Peroni. Nathan's name got mentioned a few times, but he's been on a very similar sort of journey into commercial partnerships. Uh, if you want to hear from him when he was doing some of his earlier casual experience at, at the AFL, that's episode 81. And then if you want to hear from him uh, in part two when he's got his commercial partnerships job, jobs and uh hear the transition that he made as well that's episode 181 somehow managed to do it 100 episodes later yeah, so that's pretty cool 183 181 and 81 do you know what brant is as well from memory brant was like the first week of the afl finals yeah uh this is brant hubber we're talking about the commercial partnerships coordinator at the afl and he would be 212 because he was the week after Brian yeah. Taylor, who's 210. Brilliant. Jeez, you're good with numbers. He's good, <laughs> How isn't do he? you remember that? Wow. Uh, it's just periods of time stick in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's brilliant. I, I'm shocking. I could not tell you oh, uh, a that. number. Do you I remember know? a guess. Well, I, I, I can like – I associate the number with like the month and the year. Do you remember bowling figures from different innings that you were playing? <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember last week I took three for 62. Oh, <laughs> oh that's <laughs> shocking. was waiting for. It only took 40 minutes for him to mention yeah. it. Oh, God. Just casual 22 overs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's a workhorse. <laughs> wow. We'll end it on that note. Uh, mate, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I'm glad that I could join this episode this time. Um, flat I missed the first one, but... Um, I can say, you know, on behalf of both of us, we're, we're super proud of you, mate. Like, it's been unreal seeing your journey from, you know, finishing uni to now just absolutely killing it at Golf Australia. Um, and it's been awesome sort of, you know, being a part of that journey throughout and it's just sort of hearing how you're going. So um, your journey should, you know, really act as a bit of an example for, for those listening in about how to how to get in and, and, and start doing all those right things to, to reach your goal. So... Thanks again, mate, and, and good luck for the next 12 months with your extension. Keep buying the coffees and uh, and keep rolling in before, uh, before 8 because it's obviously paying off for you. So thanks, thanks for, again. Thanks for the support. Appreciate it.
Guys, it's time now for everybody's favourite segment every single Monday. It is called Ask Sports Crowd, where every week we answer a question from our community. If you'd like to ask a question, first become a Sports Crowd member at www.sportscrowd.com.au slash community, and then add your question to the channel named Ask Sports Crowd on our member-only Discord. Rubes, this one comes from Angus. And he says, when joining a new company, how do you establish a vision as to where you can take the organization? Mm. Big Gr- question. Great question. Deep yeah. question. Um, and so I, love deep. That, I love that people early in their career are thinking about this, this sort of thing because mm. I reckon it's the most fun part of the job, like getting to conceptualize what the vision of an organization is before yep. going, to, going to implement it. Like when you're in that brainstorming phase, it's very creative and that's, mm. that's my favorite part. Um, uh, cool. So ha- how do you do it? So say you're, you're joining an organization for the first time. Um, if you are joining an established organization that's been around for a lot longer than you have, then you want to spend that first period of time just getting the lay of the land. You want to start to mm-hmm. collect as much information as possible, talk to as many people as you can, learn about the organization, learn about the other people who work there and what they do in their jobs, learn about the market that you operate in, learn about the customer as well, yeah. learn about you know what is the specific problem that you're trying to solve, so that you've got all the data that you need to then go forth and, and make a decision on which direction are we going to take uh, the company in. So once you've got that, then you want to start to think about w- what does success look like, and so this can kind of come in a couple of different formats. You know, if you're stepping into a CEO role, you're going to be looking at what does success look like company wide. If you're heading in, if you're stepping into a head of department type role, that's when you might think of success just for your department. What does success for my department look like? So, for example, um, when we were at Cricket Australia, I remember when Kevin Roberts stepped in and he set the new vision, which was to unite and inspire communities through cricket. That's his role, mm. umbrella sort of vision. Um, whereas when I was in the digital team, you know, the the vision might have been something like make cricket accessible to everybody. Everyone should be able to consume some cricket content in some way, shape or form. For the commercial team, it could be something like deliver exceptional value for partners that forms long-term relationships. So you're starting to narrow mm-hmm. in on, on your space. So once you've got the data, once you know what success looks like, then you want to create buy-in because there's no point you saying, this is what the vision is. Everyone just come with me you got to get buy-in from your team and, and the people around you. So that's mm. when um, you – that's typically when these these off-sites happen or these workshops happen. That's when you get, you know, 10, 20 people in a room to decide which direction we're going to go and how we're going to get there together because when everyone gets involved, everyone feels like they're a part of it and that just impacts their, their day-to-day motivation to do the things that drive the company forward. So, for example, I remember um, – at Cricket Australia, we had a a conference in the Hinterland Valley about an hour's drive from Byron Bay <laughs> where it was a commercial team and all the Cricket Australia commercial partners glamping for a night. <laughs> in this the, was the flood, huh? Yeah, this wasn't a flood. Yeah, the, the weather was terrible for this kind of event. But the purpose of it was to get all the Cricket Australia partners together and, and workshop um, – how do we deliver value to each other and grow cricket and grow each other's businesses mm. at the same time? And so you had Cricket Australia there, you had Alinta Energy there, ComBank, uh, Dettol, uh, KFC, like all, all these major, major executives controlling multi-million dollar marketing budgets were there. Yeah. And they all together d- discussed, you know, what's most important for us. And so that kind of set the tone and set the theme for the next year of, how are we all going to work together to achieve yeah. this vision? And because it, they were all involved, it was something that they actually believed in. You know, when it doesn't work is when you go ahead, create a vision, stick it on a piece of paper, hand it to everyone and say, all right, now do this. Yeah. That doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, Angus, I love that you're thinking about this sort of thing, but it starts with getting context to where you're at, having an idea of what does success look like, and then creating buy-in so that you can actually deliver on that. Awesome. I love what you said at the end around the, the bit of paper. Like I feel like that happens way too often. <laughs> yeah, you actually got to do it day to day, week to week. Mm. Um, but yeah, great question. I love that. 
It's interesting. We haven't really had much of that before. Mm. Um, brilliant. Well, that was our sports grad. Um, as I said at the start, you can submit your questions via the Ask Sports Grad channel on our Discord. Just become a member and you can get access to that. Um, this Wednesday, we're talking LinkedIn and LinkedIn profiles and link, LinkedIn posts, LinkedIn everything. Mm. So get on board this Wednesday, um, 7 p.m. That's our member event for the week. Um, all these Q&As are recorded. So when you join as a member, you get every single Q&A that we've ever done in a bank, in a library, <laughs> ready to access. That's over 50 hours of content. Um which is incredible. And you would have just heard Clayton mention some of the resources that, that helped him get his job. You would have, yes. And right. you would have heard him say the importance of LinkedIn and getting that internship at the NRL. So absolutely, jump in if you want some similar results. Yes. So um, become a member today, sportsgrad.com.au slash community. You can get all that content exclusive to you. Um, finally, find us on LinkedIn. As I mentioned, give us some love. Give us, uh, you know, a five-star rating if you could, if you enjoy the show. Subscribe on Apple and follow on Spotify. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey, guys, one last thing before you go. If you'd enjoy a quick email from us each Friday on all the latest job openings, networking events, Q&As with industry professionals and latest podcast episodes, then subscribe to the Sports Grad newsletter head to our website www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's also a link in our show notes to join.